terms of the formal presentation, though, let me begin first of all by thanking President Kay and her executive for having invited me to be here with you this afternoon. As she has indicated, the purpose of the gathering is for me to tell you something of the UDP's plans with respect to the business community if we are re-elected on March 7th. Let me say straight off that I hope that my presentation will be concise. I want to make it brief enough so that there is more than sufficient time for me to answer your questions afterwards. Now, someone once referred to the time of campaigning, which precedes any general election as the silly season. And indeed, we have become accustomed to expect cartoonish behavior and outlandish propaganda as a natural feature of the electoral landscape at this time. In that vein, there is one issue that has perhaps most lent itself to this theater of the absurd. That is, needless to say, the economy. Accordingly, the false charges on the score have been legion. And certainly to hear the other side tell it, the government is in dire financial straits, and it is precisely because things are so bad that I have hurriedly called an election before the crisis can become common knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, let me immediately dispatch that particular piece of misinformation. I have extracted from the Ministry of Finance the headline budget numbers for 2011-2012. The approved estimates provided for recurrent revenue of $784 million dollars. The revised outturn shows that we actually collected 831.8 million dollars. Recurrent expenditure was budgeted at 729.5 million but actually came in at 732.2 million. The option, ladies and gentlemen, is a recurrent surplus of 94.6 million dollars as opposed to the approved estimate of only $54.5 million. On the capital side, capital revenue was $6.8 million as compared to the $5.3 million budgeted, and capital expenditure was kept to $140.9 million instead of the $160.4 million projected. Altogether then, the numbers this fiscal year produced an $89.8 million primary surplus as against the $67.7 million forecast. This represented fully 3% of GDP as compared to the 2.2% that was budgeted. And even after you add amortization and interest payments, Belize's overall fiscal deficit is only 22.4 million or 0.8% of GDP as against the 46.4 million or 1.6% of GDP that was forecast. Ladies and gentlemen, even if I say so myself, this is an impressive performance and constitutes the best fiscal record in ages. Of course, the government numbers are also accompanied by a 3% GDP growth, foreign reserves of $500 million, loads of financial liquidity, and outstanding increases in tourism, citrus, and sugar earnings. I should take the opportunity to 
congratulate the president of the BTB, Mrs. Mariam Roberson, for really what has been a phenomenal year. I see that we exceeded the $250,000 market overnight visitors for the first time since 2007. Congratulations. I'm therefore proud to say that in the middle of dogged sluggishness worldwide, and especially in Europe, Belize has recorded stellar comparative gains. Now the upcoming fiscal year will be just as good, we think, with respect to economic growth. And that is why I can say in the most solemn fashion to you this afternoon that a re-elected United Democratic Party government will ensure that there are absolutely no new tax increases in the next budget year. Of course, the government of Belize numbers will have to cope with the step up in the super bonds interest rate to 8.5% over the next fiscal year. The payments will therefore go from 65 million to 92 million, but more about that a little later. Ladies and gentlemen, it is on the basic, it is on the basis, I'm sorry, of the statistics that I just finished reciting and performance over the last four years that on the whole more than kept the ship of state afloat. It is on the basis of all that that my government has been able to achieve the unprecedented social strides that saw the stitching together of a safety net of historic proportions. And it is that general safety net, together with the targeted gang intervention initiative in Belize City, that has resulted in the seminal reduction in crime and the murder rate that we saw particularly in the last four months of 2011. Since we introduced that gang truce in September, the murder rate dropped something like 37% between September and December of 2011 as compared to the similar period the year before. That reduction in the murder rate continues into 2012. We are at a total of eight murders for the year so far as compared to 2011 when by this juncture we had had 14 with six in February of 2011 which was the lowest monthly murder rate for the entire 2011. Well already uh, in January of this year we had just if I can use that word in connection with something as fundamentally tragic as a murder rate. We had just four murders and so far in fe February another four. Ladies and gentlemen, when the UDP manifesto is launched on Monday, I have an advanced copy here, it will contain a message from me and I would like now to read one excerpt from that message because of how important I think it is. And I quote, in its first term, the UDP set great store by its pro-poor initiatives, its housing, education, employment, and infrastructure drive. Government, as a matter of policy and deliberate strategy, became bigger. At a time of shrinking private sector activity, because of planetary conditions, this was, in my view, the right thing to do, the only thing to do. But the second term should see a gradually improving worldwide economic climate with an eventual return 
to previous levels of foreign direct investment and international tourism activity. This now requires greater emphasis on the Belizean private sector and that government should do more to ensure the kind of enabling climate that will spur greater job creating and wealth enhancing business activity in Belize. This then will be the challenge for the next UDP government to consolidate and expand public sector investment in people and the economy while at the same time harnessing growth and development firmly to an enhanced driver's role for the private sector. End of quotation. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that I think that the building blocks are in place and the foundation has been well and truly laid by government's perhaps Keynesian policies over the last four years. But we are now at a point where we must once again recognize the private sector's pride of place in any truly sustainable leap forward. It should be clear by now, therefore, that I am proposing a radically altered relationship between government and the private sector. A new overarching paradigm must be created in which official bureaucracy and red tape must be cut. Detailed rules of engagement and a carefully constructed roadmap must be agreed. And a culture in government of quick, courteous, and efficient service would be a sine qua non of the next UDP administration. Now a start has already been made with the operational structures that we jointly set up coming out of last year's business forum. And to put more meat on the bone, so to speak, government has committed to the appointment of the Chamber's Amparo Masson as the business development officer working out of the office of the Prime Minister. We have not finalized a signed contract simply because the elections have intervened and we do not want to be accused of tying a new administration's hand in the event, unlikely I think it is, uh, unlikely though I think it is, that we are not re-elected. I'm also announcing today that a new UDP government would as well create a new office of marketing czar. As we drive ahead with you, I can conceive of nothing more important than a marketing emissary with the right staff to search the world for countries to which we can sell our products and from which we can solicit direct foreign investment. Again, such a person would be responsible to the office of the Prime Minister and would be drawn from the private sector. I can think of a few names, but perhaps I should leave that alone for now. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that there will be lots to work out in partnership with you. Already though, we have come up with a number of particular initiatives that I hope will convince you this afternoon that we are fully prepared to walk the walk. These include, but are not limited to, first, exempting, we plan to exempt from personal income tax all shareholder income derived from private companies that gross five million dollars or less. I gather that as things now stand there is almost a form of, of double uh, taxation uh, and so we're quite committed to ensure that all shareholder income derived from these private companies will not be taxed in the hands of the shareholders slash businessmen. We will give tax credits for expenditure on new construction. Now this would include both business and residential construction. The quantum of the credit would be a percentage of the expenditure 
with clearly a ceiling on the amount of the tax credit that we will give. An alternative to this idea would be to offer instead partial duty exemption on construction material for new projects. That though would involve a large element of discretion on the part of the Minister of Finance. I fully intend to be back as Minister of Finance and it's not that I don't trust myself but I don't like that element of discretion. I much prefer the more objective, more easily quantifiable tax credit. But we will consult with you before deciding which of the two options to implement. We also will establish a mortgage guarantee scheme to assist, to assist first-time homeowners to cover the 10% down payment on mortgage loans of $100,000 or less. Uh, the banks will tell you that there is a 10% down payment that people need to make. Uh, government would establish a, a fund uh, that would, in fact, cover the 10% so that the people wouldn't have to find this up front. Um, we would, of course, expect that the commercial banks will ensure that we have first call on the repayment of the, of the mortgage loans uh, so that by the time uh, anyone defaults, we expect that our 10% would have been recovered. But in the event that there are early defaults, we will simply to, to, to meet that burden and make good on our guarantee. This again we think will do a great deal to uh, stimulate the lending sector. Interest rates have already gone way down in terms of mortgage loans and this certainly should help to drive construction even more. We expect that the great and good Belize Telecommunications Limited will introduce and I choose my words carefully, limited VoIP to landline customers. Limited. Clearly we have not yet paid compensation. The company did extremely well last year. That's one of the reasons why our recurrent revenue uh, was so robust because of better than expected dividends from BTL. And we certainly can't afford to make BTL any less viable, um, perhaps a little less profitable, but certainly we're not looking at anything to fundamentally affect viability. So uh, we will have to introduce this VoIP in tranches, in installments, and we expect the first such installment to take place over the next few months. We also, ladies and gentlemen, will charter an export guarantee program, particularly for small businesses. We've seen examples of people who have been able to secure markets, pretty much assured guaranteed markets, but then when time comes to put together their product for export, they, they, for export, they can't um, meet the shipping costs or in various ways they fall short. We will establish a fund that would step in to assist uh, people in that particular predicament on the basis of course of having examined uh, the, the prospects and, and assuring ourselves that the, the export market is there, does in fact exist. We will amend Section 1091 of the Income and Business Tax Act to remove the criminalization of late filings of business tax returns. Uh, those of you, I suppose none of you would be familiar with this aspect of the law because none of you is ever guilty of late filings. But if you do peruse the statute, a copy of which I brought, you will see that if you're guilty of late filings, you can be 
visited upon conviction with a $10,000 fine or actual imprisonment in lieu of that fine. We think that is an anomaly. We think it is an anachronism. We think it is entirely too punitive. We don't believe that the criminal law has any room for operation, should have any sway uh, with respect to an issue such as this. So we will take that out of the law completely. As things now stand though, apart from that criminalization, there are also two civil penalties that attach to late filings. 10% of the amount due or assessed for each month or part of a month in which the return was not delivered becomes <laughs> due and payable to the government of Belize. And interest rate on top of that, or rather interest on top of that at the rate of one and one half percent per month or part thereof is additionally uh, to be uh, taken from you for this business of late filing. Now we will remove one of the two penalties, not both, because I think if we did away with penalties altogether, that would constitute moral hazard. That would be an encouragement for people <laughs> simply <laughs> not to file on time. But, but the two together, uh, we think uh, that's far too punitive. I, in my thinking, we would want to take away the 10% and just leave the one and one half uh, percent interest per month. But again, Madam President, we will consult with you to see which of the two you would prefer for us to eliminate. Now, we would also further amend the Income and Business Tax Act to remove that requirement that obliges payment of the entire tax assessed upfront, even where the taxpayer has appealed to the Income Tax <coughs> Appeal Board. We think to tie up your money like that uh, when there is a legitimate dispute is not fair. What we propose to do is to provide that the disputed tax will not have to be paid until the appeal board has made a timely decision. We'll have to couch this very carefully because what we don't want is of course uh, for it to happen that appeal boards can't meet and then government never gets uh, its tax because there certainly would not be any sense of urgency on the part of the, the, the taxpayer to have the matter concluded. But once we can arrange things so that we can be certain of timely meetings and decisions of the income tax appeal board, we will forego the collection of the disputed tax until that decision is in. Even after the Income Tax Appeal Board gives its decision, of course, you would only pay the tax if a further appeal to the Supreme Court has not resulted in a stay. You're perfectly entitled to apply to the Supreme Court for a stay if you're not happy with the decision of the Income Tax Appeal Board and are taking it further to the Supreme Court. Now, ladies and gentlemen, all that I've set out will be done without prejudice to the complete overhaul of the tax laws of this country. Madam President, we had already committed to you that this is an exercise that is overdue and that will be done. We are in the process of securing the technical help for that exercise, but because we recognize that it will be some time before completion, we have decided to go ahead with the immediate forms of relief and stimulation that I just outlined. Before I close and take your questions, ladies and gentlemen, there are three more issues I want to address. The first is the cost of capital in Belize. But and the need for lower commercial, for still lower, I should say, commercial bank lending rates. That's some good news. 
Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> now, you know, I've been on about this for a while. <laughs> and I'm glad to report that with the help of the chamber, the commercial banks have agreed to a meeting with me and the central bank to resolve this matter. I saw Glenn when I was traveling uh, to the States the last time, and he, in fact, confirmed to me that he thought th that this meeting had been suggested by the chamber and that he was very much on board with it. Again, the election pressure <laughs> on, on my time has delayed this from happening. The president uh, sought to oblige me a while ago to fix a date. <laughs> um, and I've said to her that if it is convenient, perhaps uh, we can do this next Monday. The second, so it is clear to me that, that additional relief is coming by way of even lower lending rates. The second matter I want to talk about as I conclude is the super bond. I've already said that the step up in the interest rate means that we will have to pay $92 million on the coupons this coming fiscal year. Uh, we've paid last week, we remitted the funds in time for today, which was the due date for the February payment. It's a holiday in the States, so I think we gave them their money early. Uh, and we are in no doubt about our ability to make the increased payment that kicks in with the August installment. But ladies and gentlemen, when in making the announcement of the date for the general election, I said that I in particular was seeking a new mandate to among other things do something about the super bond, I was in deadly earnest. Restructuring will have to come sooner or later. And for the sake of Belize, I think it is sooner rather than later. I see that Nomura, one set of foreign analysts, has already laid out the case for restructuring with, with approval. And set out a scenario that, in their view, would work to Belize's benefit without unduly prejudicing the bondholders. So notwithstanding the rating agency's rush to, to judgment, Nomura is encouraging its clients to buy Belize's bonds in the full knowledge that there will be a restructuring. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that as the way things are playing out all over the world shows, there cannot be bad borrowers without bad lenders. And we must, as others are doing, renegotiate to get better terms that will free us up, even if just a little bit, from this albatross. I don't have to tell you what it would do for our finances and the economy to pay, for example, a 5% interest rate instead of that 8.5. Uh, and of course, that would have to come in the context of a far longer maturity period on the bond. I should tell you that I discussed this matter with the National Trade Union Congress of Belize last week. And I'm happy to report that they fully support renegotiation. I would hope, Madam President, that the Chamber will too. The final point with which I would like to deal is oil prices. Business is no doubt mightily pleased with the decrease in electricity rates scheduled to take effect with this month's bill. But as you all know, we are getting hammered at the pump by the continued increases in the international oil prices. The next UDP government would therefore propose to do two things. First, we would build storage tanks that would allow Belize to resume the importation of the concessionary Venezuelan fuel. You recall what had happened 
the last government, Venezuela sells this thing on concessionary terms on a state-to-state -state basis. The last government sort of subcontracted to the uh, private individuals here who built the tanks and who uh, then paid government for the fuel and then unsold to the consumer. We got into a great kerfuffle with them because they didn't want to, in fact, uh, accept any loss on any shipment. The, the, the base price to the consumer is determined uh, with reference really to, to the ESO uh, prices since that ESO continues to be the, the larger, well now the, back once again, the only importer of refined petroleum products into Belize. Anyway, that went asunder and so we no, no longer buy fuel from Venezuela. Now, there is land that government owns down in Big Creek not too far from where the current storage tanks that were built by the people in Big Creek, not too far from where those are. And we propose to build a storage tank or two. We don't propose to get into the business of retailing fuel, of, of, of selling fuel. But we want to use that so that we can buy the fuel from Venezuela and distribute to government. If we can do that, the savings that would be effected as a consequence would then be used to fool around with the tax on the imported products that ESO retails uh, to continue to make or to make those taxes always as low as possible in order to try to keep the pump price stable. But ladies and gentlemen, in addition to that, we are absolutely clear that a local refinery must be built to turn our crude into gasoline. Now, you remember that uh, Blue Star had, had started this and then afterwards sold the operation to... Sky. Blue Sky, I'm sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me. Afterwards sold the operation to BNE and BNE said it would continue but shut it down. Uh, that experiment showed that it is possible to do the local refining and to sell the refined products uh, far more cheaply here at home than is the cost of the imported petroleum products. Until we find more oil, we also have to look at the fact that as we go along, uh, the production, the BNE production, continues to decrease and it will soon reach a point where it's not going to be practical, it's not going to be viable to export with all the, the costs that that entails. So <coughs> apart from job creation, apart from law, it appears to us that in planning for the future we have to recognize the inevitability of making use of our local crude output right here at home uh, in the context of what I just mentioned about uh, the declining viability of exporting it as the amount continues to reduce. Now ladies and gentlemen there is a Mexican private sector group I have a letter from them that I just got today out of Monterrey that wants to build that refinery and we would clearly prefer to go the route of private sector construction but government would be committed in the event that proposal falls through and none other emerges to itself build 
the refinery. Uh, we have uh, people like John Mencius here and Jeff Locke, Ambrose Tillett, others that could head up such a project and we have no doubt that we would be able to do this and do this successfully in a pinch. The point is that at all costs, this has to get done so that we might achieve this nirvana of lo lower <laughs> lo local fuel prices to Belizeans. Ladies and gentlemen, I will stop there as I believe I have gone far enough to do two things. I believe I have demonstrated that the UDP is serious in a structured, well-planned and systematic way about engaging, bolstering and benefiting the private sector. Thank you very much again, Madam President.